fashion is an essential part of the Gossip Girl phenomenon. The show is looked to within the fashion world as really having its finger on the pulse of young fashion. We wanted fashion to be like a character in the show. In this world, your clothing represents your status. These girls definitely exist, and they definitely wear the best of the best. Fashion. 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 I love fashion. 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 It was approached because I had done a project with Amy Kaufman, who's one of the producers. She introduced me to Stephanie Savage, and I interviewed with Stephanie, and they seemed very interested in having kind of a younger gun come in and give it that kind of New York edge that they were looking for. First time that I met Eric Damon, our costume designer, I had come with my binder, and he had come with his binder. We talked once or twice and emailed a little bit about, you know, her ideas and my ideas. And as I was talking about Sienna Miller and Bohemian Chic and Kate Moss, Eric was pulling out his tears that were matching my tears and, you know, were the same idea. I'd say 75 to 85% of the tear sheets were the exact same in each book. It was a great feeling. It was really quite thrilling when reading the pilot, thinking, like, oh, we can actually maybe get to do something very New York and kind of fashion forward. What we could do with the costumes and who these girls were going to be and who these boys were and, like, what kind of world this is set in. Everybody has their own sense of style in the show. Even the boys have their own diverse style. Serena Blair. Even the guys wearing ridiculous, fabulous outfits is just absolutely central and fundamental to the books, fundamental to the TV show. Eric Damon does an amazing job of, of realizing that and making that real and concrete on a daily basis. Jenny started out a very, like, eclectic, downtown, not moneyed look. Her style changed along with her personality a little bit. She takes little pieces of what she learns from the older girls and puts them into her own style. Kind of base it on a Molly Ringwald pretty in pink moment. She's from the other side of the track. She doesn't have the money that she needs to keep up with these other girls. But she has sewing skills, and she's really savvy, and she can, you know, find a great bag in a vintage store that looks just like the Marc Jacobs bag. It's kind of nice to give her a little bit of an intellectual edge and, you know, a little or like street savvy Brooklyn girl that knows how to put it together. Jenny wears so many funky tights and socks. So it's a big thing is like her socks and her tights. It's a new, every wardrobe fitting with the uniform, we're like, what tights do I get to wear this time? <laughs> She's colorful, bright oranges and bright pinks, mix it up with like browns. There's an earth tone kind of underset to it, but then it's coordinated with a bright pink coat or bright orange tights or, you know, bright pink shoes with yellow platforms. In the beginning, she was wearing like lots of gummy bracelets and, you know, candy bracelets and little cutesy necklaces, which made sense for who she was in the beginning. And now she's evolved into wearing a stack of gold bracelets with big navy sapphires in it. Really nice cameo necklaces, things that still kind of feel vintage and that things you could acquire that still is believable for who she is and what kind of monetary set she's from, but also is integrating her into becoming more of a gossip girl herself. Jenny started out with straight hair um, because it was like a younger look and now that she's stepping up and becoming more mature, we're doing um, more curls. I don't think a lot of people realize everything's really thought out from the outfits to the jewelry to the hair to the even how much eyeliner someone has on. She's trying to look more mature and a little more sophisticated, but I do think with Jenny, um, she still has a little bit of originality. You can sort of match it to whatever you're wearing or what the event is, and that's what's fun. That's when you really get to play. Nate Archibald is our all-American, yacht-loving, waspy, East Coast, beautiful boy. In the beginning was the counterpart to Blair. Nate's stuff is, you know, more classic. I like wearing the suit. I like his uniform. It's a little bit more, you know, loose, you know, loose tie and done, untucked, kind of floppy mop hair. A lot of blues, almost everything's blue. I like that, you know. Feed off a lot of, like, the character aspects in the books. I think it was important for us to translate that into who the characters were and try to bring that into the script as much as possible, be it through storylines or through costumes. The whole concept about Nate in the books, too, is he's big on yachting, and it's a whole thing. So we want to do a whole, like, yachting kind of nautical theme, very kind of Ralph Lauren. A little Abercrombie, just to keep it young and sexy, but also kind of in the high end, J. Press, Brooks Brothers, like all of the, you know, kind of old Kennedy suits and that kind of feel. But we also kind of went with the idea that maybe his mom was buying him his clothes, and they were just all like the best of the best, and that he didn't really care about. He wears everything very kind of rumpled and lived in. Like, you'll never see Nate in like a perfectly pressed shirt. Like, Nate has, you know, a Laura Piano $500 dress shirt, but doesn't really care about it. He just has this kind of navy blue and light blue palette that we work with, kind of feeding off the nautical theme, but also feeding off of Chase's beautiful eyes. Saying different kind of blues, really, his eyes just go crazy on it. It's great for camera, and it's great for the viewers at home. I came in with pictures.
members of you know, like Jackie Onassis and Audrey Hepburn. I'll be blocking and rehearsing the scene, and I'm like, okay, this will go really well. And then I put on the clothes, and then suddenly I'm the character. She has a very high-end sense of style. Everything she wears is pretty much designer. She loves high-waisted skirts. She loves crisp jackets. In the beginning, it wasn't so eccentric, and then we've kind of taken it to the next level of like oh, being a little more over the top with her precise putting together things. Like everything's like it's a dot on a dot with a dot headband, and kind of like pushing it to the next level a little bit. The best way to describe it is that she's appropriate. If she's going to sushi dinner, she dresses exactly like you're supposed to. If she's going to a wedding, that's exactly how she would dress. You know, it's like, it just always makes sense. Blair has her ruby heart-shaped ring that she wears all the time. It's kind of like her signature piece. It's really beautiful. It was, you know, kind of sweet and endearing. It was a beautiful ruby, had a great red to it. She also does lots of pearls. She does like lots of little, like, you know, they very ladies who lunch. But in a contemporary way, she like wear big oversized pearls, or like big oversized pearl earrings. We have these great bracelets from this designer called Dita that's like orange snakeskin with little pearls set into them and gold chain. Like to keep it very contemporary so it doesn't get old and stodgy. Blair has her signature headband. We imagine it sort of as like her crown. It's her little tiara that she puts on every morning. I am the queen, therefore I must mark my queenness with my little headband. Her followers also don their headbands as a way to show allegiance to her. She is almost like a modern day Audrey Hepburn breakfast at Tiffany's. Very polished. Blair's makeup is very well put together. It's not very often that you'll see her without it. Even if you notice when she wakes up in the morning, she always looks fantastic. <laughs>is our urban dandy, I like to call him. The palette is kind of all over the place. We can go from navies and we can go from pinks and we can go from Kelly greens and you know, as long as it's sharp and pulled together and looks amazing, he can wear it. Chuck's style is at times eccentric, at times classic. He's not scared of a bit of color. He's never bland and it's totally reflective of his personality. There really is a guy in New York who's wearing a carnation in his lapel, who would wear a bowler hat, who would wear a white suit or a red suit or pay a lot of attention to what kind of shoes he was wearing. He was kind of our editorial answer to what the male Upper East Side boy is. A little bit of an urban edge, to, you know, keeping track with lots of like really great cutting edge sneakers, like the brand new Nike that just got shipped from Japan, that only he has a pair of them. And of course his signature scarf, which has become its own kind of entity in itself. The Petra scarf comes from the book, too. They, they talk about the scarf and how it's his signature thing. It was a whole process of, like, finding what this scarf was. We went through so many scarves. And I was just out shopping one day at this men's store called J Press. And I just saw this random scarf. It was, like, made of all these leftover tie pieces. It was just a patchwork of, like, the most beautiful tie silks. I was like, that's the scarf. So we got the scarf approved. We got the scarf on TV. And all of a sudden, someone leaked that it came from the store. And the stores sold out of them in a week. very kind of uptight and rigorous and everything's like well thought out where Serena, you know, kind of just picks up whatever she finds on the floor and kind of has a tossled, sexy, just for a lot of bed look, you know, very natural and just very thrown together. Had all these beautiful designer clothes, but she would wear them with her old jeans and her great boots and her slouchy cap and look amazing. Which sounds really easy, but when you're trying to put the outfits together to make it look like it's just Tossed and thrown together is really a very difficult challenge. I love Serena's sense of style so much. It's a fine attention to detail, the pieces that she has. She has such interesting pieces, but it's all thrown together in, in such a unique way that it just looks effortless and kind of windswept. Blake already had that kind of thing to her, you know? She just was like very relaxed and very natural and just had a kind of this innate sensibility to her that kind of really lent itself to becoming Serena, I think. There's a great designer named Gemma Redux. She'll take a copper chain and a white gold chain, a pink gold chain and a black gold chain and like braid them all together and make these kind of very heavy, like drippy, kind of sensual necklaces that are just like pieces of chain that are all linked together. This is um, a Gemma Redux necklace, which I love. She's one of my favorite necklace designers that we have here on the show. There's a designer that I actually discovered um, in a store in New York City, Margo Morrison, and I fell in love with her pieces and I met her and she's like, oh my gosh, I love the show, I'd love to send stuff. So she sent like 60 pieces home with me to take on the show. Serena has her beautiful long hair. It does 
doesn't matter if it's straight, if it's curly, if she just got out of the shower or she's getting ready for a party. She just has that like incredible mane of traffic stopping hair. She doesn't spend too much time doing her hair. It's always a little unconstructed. Her hair is never perfect. That's her whole energy and her whole attitude is very much, well, I gotta go to this event, you know, I'll wear a ponytail. Who wears ponytails to like a cotillion? She's always pretty. She always looks fresh, very carefree, but there is obviously a lot of thought being put into her. Dan, I call him our existential poet from Williamsburg. He's kind of that tortured poet boy that's from the wrong side of the tracks, doesn't really care about fitting in, just wants to get into the best schools and read his books and write his poetry, but then ends up falling in love with Serena Vanderwood. So he also has to dress as appropriately as he can within his means, but still keeping his own personal style. He's a great like military coat that's kind of like his signature piece that he wears all the time to school, has like one bag. And then we just get into like really great kind of vintage feeling, like 60s kind of French New Wave. Kind of feeling with them like really great beat up dress shoes and little skinny ties and vests. And keep it kind of dressed up because, you know, we don't want him to just look some schlocky Williamsburg guy. Dan's style greatly benefits from Eric um, being our costume designer because otherwise he'd probably be in like, you know, khakis and like, you know, Doc Martens or something and collared shirts because he's, he's the awkward kid from Brooklyn. Eric has given him this amazing, like, you know, he wears skinny jeans, um, a lot of button downs with the sleeves rolled up and like cardigans over it. Uh, nice jackets. I mean, he got great shoes. Nice, like, Italian loafers. These shoes here are incredible. <laughs> these are these are some Italian, and we've got, like, soundproofing on the bottom of them. They're on another show, the same character would not at all have the same flair. We're very lucky to have him. He already, before the show, I mean, was very ahead of the trends, and now he's able to set them even more firmly. So I'll give you a specific instance. There's a boot in the Blake Warren episode. It's like these knee-high sort of, I think, suede. It's like a $50 boot, which, relatively speaking on the show, that's a cheap item. And next day, I think, across the country, in every store, they were sold out. Now, too, a lot of designers are just sending us things. They're so happy to be a part of the show and to participate. It also allows us to have access to things that we can't, we couldn't purchase. Two is also very helpful in trying to take this kind of heightened reality and fashion to the next place. It's really exciting to be able to be a part of that. And, you know, it's something you can't even dream of being a costume designer to be able to start something like this. You know, our costumes are better than anybody's clothes that I see in real life, even these supermodels that get clothes given to them. We have better clothes than that sitting right here at our fingertips. It's a phenomenon on its own. The show's on and the next day, there's like websites about, you know, Blair's bag or that headband. When people look back on 2007, 2008, did Gossip Girl make it into the record book? Did anybody notice? Did anybody care? It's an amazing show to work on. It's also this thing that people talk about, and it's like it grows without us, you know? And, and as a result, we grow. So things like magazine covers, our stars getting noticed, our actors appearing on talk shows, internet chat, who's recapping the show, that's the kind of stuff that makes us really excited because that feels like whatever you're doing is reacting to people. The ratio of experience to the notoriety that we've now gotten is way, <laughs> it doesn't correlate anymore, you know? I'm very thankful to have this kind of opportunity to be able to maybe create trends and take it take trends to another level and try to put something new and different on television for a younger set. And I thank Stephanie and Josh and my lucky stars every day. I love it, I really do. And wouldn't trade it for the world. 